Lots of people don't like history because it's just boring. Lots of people don't like history because there are too many facts to remember. But in modern times, it seems as if everyone is a historian. Like past historians, they record what they deem to be important. If you don't believe me, you can check Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and you will see history documented like never before. In chapter eight, we get a history lesson. And some of the elements of this history lesson were taken from research that I did for one of our conferences called the 21st Century Woman. In it, we talk about Leah and about how she was rejected by the two most important men in her life her father and her husband. And we looked at how God favorably looked upon Leah and how God blessed her with the most prized possession for a woman of that time, sons. She was so blessed, she gave birth to the firstborn son of Jacob or Israel, and his name was Reuben. She also gave birth to the father of the priest, Levi. She gave birth to the father of many of the kings, Judah, and she had the most amount of sons, six in total. To understand the Bible, especially from 1 Kings onward, you need to know your biblical history, especially the history of the sons of Israel. You also need to know that from 1 Kings, not every time the Bible mentions the term priest, it is speaking about the priest of the Lord. Similarly, not every time the Bible mentions the term prophet, it is speaking about the prophet of the Lord. Also, in the Old Testament, whenever the term God is mentioned, it is not necessarily speaking about the creator of all things. You see, in 1 Kings, Jeroboam created a parallel priesthood from what the King James Version of the Bible says were of the lowest of the people, which were not of the sons of Levi. So as I said before, from 1 Kings, we need to understand who the writer is speaking about when he used the term priest or prophet. Is he speaking about the priest of the Lord or the priest of Baal? The prophet of the Lord or the prophet of Baal? So just to go down a rabbit trail a little bit, in the Old Testament, whenever the term God is used, it is used in a generic sense. It is referring to beings that live in what we call that unseen realm. You can better understand it by comparing it to the term man. That term man could mean male man or it could mean mankind in general. So whenever the term God is used, it is a generic term. That is why many times in the Bible you will see this term, Lord God. And that term, Lord God, is identifying which spiritual being or which being in the unseen realm the writer is speaking about. I spent some time talking about this in another one of our conferences called the 21st Century Marriage. But what about today? When you hear the term Christian, what does that term mean? Is it referring to a particular person born into a community with um, shared beliefs? Or is it referring to a person who has made a conscious decision to pledge their allegiance to the Lord God of the Bible? Spoiler alert here. The priests of the Northern Kingdom, Obadiah's Kingdom, were not priests of the Lord. They never were. It was not a place for servants, only workers. I believe too many churches today have allowed themselves to become places for workers and not servants. Later on in the chapter, I used the term credentialed prophets as another jab at this idea of the community not being a place for servants, only workers. And I can go on and on with this. This is something that I am truly passionate about. But what I will say for now is that if your credentials or the appointments that you received that were done by men are not in sync with your calling from God, then you would lack that passion 
there will be little or no joy. You will become frustrated, depressed, um, even bitter in what is supposed to be your service unto God. And it will not be service unto God, just a job that you do within a particular community. But I believe we need to change this. And you can change this by finding out what God has called you to do and striving your best to do that. And I believe Obadiah's secrets can play some small part in assisting with this by allowing you to understand what God requires in order to serve him. So if the book has impacted you significantly in any way, I encourage you to lend it to someone that you believe can benefit from the book. Or if you're like me who sometimes lend books out and don't get it back, buy a copy for them. Let's make churches and religious institutions once again a place for servants and not workers. The founders of the Northern Kingdom changed the object of worship while keeping the artifacts of worship in place. I believe this sentence applies equally now as it did then or maybe more so now than then because it is so much easier to change the object of worship when worship has become a spectator sport. We should actively engage in thinking about the person we are worshiping when we engage in worship and we should be thinking about his nature, about his character and I believe that this will have a tremendous impact on how we worship God. Chapter 8 also explores the idea of going back to your spiritual roots. There are many groups and individuals who have been seeking to do this, especially in the past 20 years or so. And my comment on this activity is this. They failed to realize that even their forefathers had forefathers. Before the names of many gods were familiar to human ears, only one name was known. Before there was ancient history, there was foundational history. Before men worshipped many gods, because there was no other, they worshipped only one. So if you plan to go back to your spiritual roots, I suggest that you go further than ancient history. You should go back to foundational history. And that, my friend, is a good note to end on. Because I believe going back to your spiritual roots is a core element of Obadiah's secrets.